All right, so here's a few news articles that are fun. Um, this one is from a strange paper that's poorly written that I've never seen before, and I don't see a second report about this. So I don't know if it's one of those things that was found in a foreign country and didn't make it to the American press, or maybe if it's just wrong. But what these guys claim is that Siemens programmable logic controllers, which are really important, they're the ones used in nuclear isotope separators and a lot of other equipment, they claim that um, there is a, um, when you reload the firmware, there is a brief period of time when the process that verifies software updates, when you update it, it has some brief period of time during the update process when you can inject any code and it will run it. And therefore, um, this means both that you could take over the machines and also it helps researchers that want to get in the code to see how it works. So um, it sounds interesting. I don't have any access to any of these things. It might be fun to try it and see what's going on. Anyway, it's, um, there was a similar vulnerability in Windows in the days of Windows 2000. Uh, this is how bug bear spread. In the days of Windows 2000, Microsoft had a horrible thing called Internet Connection Firewall that was really miserable because it applied the same rules to every interface, so it was almost useless. But anyway, in addition, when you boot up the machine, the network connection would come up and the firewall would not come up until like two seconds later. So you had plenty of time to attack the machine before the firewall came up. So this is a... Uh, problem that's been here before. This is pretty awesome, and I'm thinking this would be a good project for the uh, malware analysis class, or maybe even this class. I don't think I'm on the track to write it this semester, but this is very nice. Um, this is from MDSEC, and these guys are awesome. They made the Android um, package to look inside the internals of Android that we're using a lot in the mobile device hacking class. And what they're doing here is they're going to steal the clear text credentials from remote desktop clients. Now, when I first saw this, I thought perhaps it was storing those credentials in on the file system in a way you could read them. But that's not what they're doing. They're doing something more awesome. They're doing something straight out of 126. They're doing API hooking. So they, it turns out, all you have to do is call normal Windows routines. And we talked about this in quite a few of these classes. Microsoft has many routines that change the way the operating system works. And there are API calls that use these detour calls. Detours are um, things you add to the Microsoft operating system that cause it to detour and do extra code before it runs other code. And this, the problem is Microsoft is multi-purpose. So you might do something like install a strange keyboard because you're handicapped or something. And then you want every program to always go through the new keyboard, even if the designers didn't intend for that. So there are all these extra ways to tell it to always run different code. And so you can tell it to detour and so what you do is you take the login screen and you send the code somewhere else where you can get a copy of it when they log in. So it's pretty awesome. And they wrote this and they give you the code and show you how it goes. So now when you log into RDP on the hacked version of Windows, it steals your credentials and sends them elsewhere. This, um, I've done this on Linux too. When you can set up an SSH honeypot, you, since SSH is open source, you can just add extra code to the source code that makes a copy of the password and then run it. And then when people try to break in, you get all their passwords. It's really easy to do on Linux. And this looks pretty easy to do on Windows too. So this would make a great uh, project for one of these classes. Anyway, I am done. If anybody wants to do it, it's of course worth extra credit, but I haven't written up the instructions yet. I just saw it today, but it would be fun. This is another thing that's pretty awesome. And um, I'm glad I have the slides here. This was discovered in 2014 but it is apparently the, the number one attack now. I thought, when I heard about TCP amplification, um, I knew about NTP amplification and so on. There are protocols where you can send a small request and get a big answer. And the original one was the Smurf attack where you could send a directed broadcast ping and you get thousands of replies. But I didn't know you could do it with just naked TCP and that's what's interesting here. The general idea of amplification is you send a small number of packets to some amplifier and it then sends a lot of packets to your target. And, um, but he's just using the TCP handshake, which I wouldn't think would have this property. You send a SYN, they send a SYN act, now you have to send an act. Now the whole point of this is you cannot send a TCP connection to a third party, the way you can with UDP or ping. It won't make a connection unless you receive the SYN act and reply correctly, and there are numbers in that, so you can't forge them without knowing it. But what you can do is you can send a SYN to a server with a forged from address, it sends the SYNAC back to the target. The target is not expecting it, so the target does not acknowledge, so it just keeps trying over and over. Now, normally, I would think this is not much of a problem because 
the timeout is very slow. I wrote a project, used to, they used to do it in hacking class where students would do a manual TCP handshake and they found out that it has, a, I think it's from the RFCs, it does something like send a hack, then reply in like four seconds, then double the time to eight seconds and 16 and pretty soon it only sends about 10 replies and they start getting really far apart. But apparently a lot of equipment is misconfigured so it sends a lot more replies than it should. And so he tried, and then, and then this one here, there's people trying to push data and they'll send a bunch of packets trying to push a bunch of data because they have a banner that pops up and the banner might be too big to fit in a packet, I guess. So, and here's another one. You send it into a closed port and it sends a reset. That's what it's supposed to do. But there are misconfigured devices that send a lot of resets. I, I just don't know why these things exist. It's just a mistake. And so he scanned the internet and he found mind blowing stuff. You can amplify by 22 times with FTP, and that might just be the normal handshake. That might be the number of replays you get. But you can amplify by 1,600 times with SIP. So those are um, IP phones listening, servers for IP phones to connect to. And you got 80 times and 40 times and thousands of these things out there. And those are just poorly designed devices. So anyway, he found um, they are mostly running this crazy thing called Zynos from one manufacturer that apparently wrote a bad TCP stack and uh, flooded, like, like most of the Internet of Things, there is a bunch of defective devices out there that, that reply to just a simple handshake in a ridiculous way that makes them a hazard to the Internet. What so, the yeah, Zynos, uh, he had, um, he notified the vendor. Uh, Zynos is, I thought I saw a little more about them, but maybe it was in, an, anyway, I don't know what it is. Um, I don't see them anymore about it here, just it's running this thing called Zynos. Um, I think another article I saw, I gave you the, the brand name and model of the device, but I don't have it here. Um, let me see, I might be able to find it here. Um, yeah, this one here is the other article about the same topic. And I think he might have said what it is. So apparently, they're seeing a lot of people doing this apparently, even though that thing came out in 2014, for some reason the attacks are hitting now. And um, here's, you know, up to a million packets being sent uh, per hour. And um, other criminal campaigns. And I don't, there, uh, no, that's who it was being attacked. I don't think they tell us what devices are being used to amplify it here. Anyway, apparently uh, some, this is being used again. So this is pretty impressive. Uh, this woman here, um, Mina Chang, lied on her resume. And she made a fake Time Magazine, Time Magazine cover and used it in her interviews to say she was on Time Magazine. She claimed she was on panels that did charitable goods and stuff. And so Trump appointed her to the State Department because Trump has done all the same things. He has fake magazine covers of Time Magazine covers at his golf resorts and stuff. And he lies about it, how much money he makes and everything else. So he fits right in. And when he did this, he's done this many times before. He's appointed people that are just obviously crooks. And he, his announcement last time was, well, I'm saving the government money. I don't bother to do background checks. I just let the press do that for me. That's one way to look at it. Anyway, so uh, I would assume she'll be fired pretty soon and they'll, or maybe not. I mean, if you're a Republican, this is actually pretty much par for the course. And it happens a lot for our students to lie on your resume. Um, people, studies have shown like 75% of people now lie on their resume. A lot of people don't verify it, so I don't recommend it, but it is rampant. And um, so this is pretty fun. And I thought I would show you this in case you haven't seen this video. This is an awesome video. Um, let me see if I can make it loud enough. And worst of you all, you have this, put this, me in a middle cease. <laughs> this is Rachel Chubb. Oh my God. And they just let you do it. Yeah. This is a very good video. Yeah. And this played, so of course, I a major role. in Las Excuse Vegas me. for two of the world's biggest hacking conferences. And for some reason, I have agreed to be hacked. I'm meeting Rachel Toback, who specializes in a special form of hacking called social engineering. I'm very nervous. I feel like I know pretty much everything about you. I instantly don't trust you. So am I going to be safer today, thanks to you? You and every other customer will be safer today, thanks to what you're willing to let me do. Well, that's the start of guess. Okay. So you want to assume that everything that you put on social media is public. Information that can be found in places like this can be used to authenticate you with different companies. Do you remember this tweet? Yeah. I used this to gain access to your current address. What? What I did is I called up this furniture company right here. 
And I basically said, hey, we're gonna buy another one of these pieces of furniture, but I need to make sure that I don't accidentally have the wrong information on the account. And I said, no, I mean, you ordered something a while ago, but the thing that you ordered, we shipped to. I think I got this updated. Pretty scary, because that happened in 30 seconds. I got your current address. I got your birth from Twitter. I called pretty much every business that he ever listed that he used on his Twitter or Instagram. What you have to understand is when you do that, I now know which companies you use and I know which companies to call as you. What did you get from the boutique person? Your phone number and your email address. They gave you my phone number. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be doing these phone calls. I'm going to be actually live hacking. So when I call, your phone number is going to display on their caller ID. This is Joni O'Sullivan. Who are you really? No, this is Sony O'Sullivan. I can tell you my address, phone number, paper, whatever you need to know to verify that that's really me. That's wild. I am on the road right now and I'm having trouble getting access to my internet, but I need to transfer points to my friend for our bridal shower. Hopefully you can help me out over the phone. I have all the information. I have 90,000, is that correct? So the first and last name is Rachel Toback. Oh, they've been transferred? Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Are your points gone? They're gone. That is crazy. When you call this airline, it's going to be coming from my number. Yes. As you know, I have flight like, in Vegas. I'll put you in the middle. I'm trying to do this, like, personal essay thing. So can you move me to a middle seat, kind of in the back of the plane? I know you probably don't get that request a lot. Oh, perfect. Okay, so it's a row right before the last row, and it's in the middle seat. You're in the back of the plane, middle seat. I had an exit aisle. I know. He picked up saying, Mr. O'Sullivan, how can I help you? If I was not sitting here with you and didn't know, they said, well, sir, you called up and requested this, I would let <laughs> Think about how much you have to do to get into your accounts online. You have to have a password, mm. two-factor. We are basically living in the dark ages on the phone compared to how hard it is to break into accounts online. Until these companies mm -hmm. learn to change their authentication protocols, there are certain things you can do to help protect yourself. Remove your geolocation tagging. When you are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, there's just no need for people to know exactly where you're staying in those places. After that, I would say products that you buy, services that you've purchased, help that you try and get online, like on Twitter, that you're probably gonna wanna do privately. So maybe in DMs, because I'm just gonna call them up as you and try and get your information. I think the most important thing is that- All right, I think that's enough. Anyway, it's a very good stuff. She's making a lot of money uh, going to companies, demonstrating this stuff. And she won the social engineering contest at DEF CON a few times. So uh, it's a big deal. Anyway, um, so I thought I'd show you that. I saw a chat message come in. Hi, okay, hello. All right, so anyway, um, what I've got today is uh, a brief lecture about fuzzing and I'll explain there's no project to go with it because I'll explain why I abandoned the projects I used to use and I'll probably talk about some other topics a little later because this is not going to take very long. The fact is fuzzing was new at one time and very effective and all the easy fuzzing got done and now fuzzing is really hard to set up and I don't have a project that isn't too much work that I've found yet. Um, so when we tried it with the easy tools, I'll tell you as we go ahead. So anyway, the general point of fuzzing is fault injection. And this all started back in the days of dial-up modems. People would have servers running like Unix, and they'd have dial-up modems, and then there'd be a thunderstorm, which would cause faults in the line, and processes would crash on the server. And people said, it's not the power on the server failing, it's the data coming in having bad bits. So apparently there are software defects on the server, and if you send it packets that have a few bits wrong, it causes the server to crash, and that's not good. So that's the game here. And you can do a lot of this fault injection. You can also do it by running things without enough power and so on. But the most common type is network packets with bad bits. So uh, engineers have tried this sort of thing for a long time. Now. If you want to find all the bugs in your software, there's a lot of ways to do it. One effective thing is source code auditing. You use tools like Lint to just scan through the source code and find um, known problems. And that's a good step in code review. So anyway, here's the point. You run your software, which is listening on a network. You then capture some normal traffic, so you know what it looks like. Now, 
you take them to traffic and modify it. The simple thing you can do is just uh, modify the bits one by one. So you'll have a, a library of deformed packets. Then you send the deformed packets to the server and see if you can cause it to crash. And of course, uh, that's the simplest test where you just flip the bits one by one. That's not very effective. What's a whole lot better is smarter fuzzing where you identify fields of data and you change them to be really long. If there's a length field, you try making the length field not equal to the actual length that matches. You know, and the smarter you get about your injection, the faster you'll find the faults. Because if you just send random junk, then you have a random chance of hitting stuff. But if you carefully send malicious junk, it's more likely to hit what you need. And one thing that annoys software developers is if you actually put hooks in the code on the server and watch what's happening, your fuzzing is not really hitting all the code because there's like ifs and branches and conditions. And if you're doing something like making packets header fields long, there are certain conditions that are never being exercised. So a smarter fuzzer would modify the source code and make sure that you actually hit all the parts of the code. Um, and that's why uh, the really there are high quality fuzzers like American Fuzzy Lop that actually require you to recompile the source code with a bunch of hooks in it, and then it goes to the hooks to feed stuff in. Um, and you know, it, therefore, it's quite a complicated setup. Anyway, so you can send in uh, your data, and you see down here it's got a cookie. And instead of sending a, um, there's a session ID, which is a long thing, and then right in the middle of the session ID, it inserts a whole bunch of extra characters. And that's a simple thing you do. Just take every line and insert a lot of extra junk in each line to make it longer. So one thing you can do is just manually modify the input uh, or you have some kind of automated generation. Uh, one technique is where you start with real live data and then modify it. And um, that's random data. Like I said, if you have open source apps, you can modify the actual source code to make your fuzzing much better, but then it is kind of a job. You have to recompile the app, figure out where to put in those hooks and so on. Um, there are modification engines. And so if you were to just randomly change the characters here, you'd have one thing to do, but usually what's better is to choose some kind of injection like this EEY2003, and then you inject that at every step so that this extra data goes in there in different places to try to make it hit uh, something. And you can also, if you want to defeat input sanitization, for example, there might be certain characters that are illegal in certain fields, like it's supposed to be a numeric field and you can't have any letters in there. So what you do to make it longer is just repeat a letter that's already known to be good. And that way you're checking to see if it has a buffer overflow or something where the extra length will cause it to crash and it's going to go in because it's not a forbidden character. So these are, these are simple tricks to make it more effective. So, um, you make your network connection, you send your modified data, and you watch for response. Now, this used to be quite successful. I went to DEF CON about 10 years ago, and David Maynard was there, an iOS hacker. He bought a brand new Mac at the time, and he put a fuzz generator on the wireless network, and he had um, three computers. He had a Mac just listening on the wireless that card. He had another computer sending fuzzy wireless signals to it, and he had a third computer that would just ping the Mac. And he would then, the third computer was sniffing with something like Wireshark, and it was pinging the Mac, and he would let it go overnight. And when you wake up in the morning, the Mac is dead, and you go back and see in the trace where were the packets that caused it to crash. And you didn't have an exact timing, so he had like a, a five-second window. Something in this area caused it to crash. So he went and played that back slower to find out which packet would do it. And he showed a video at DEF CON of this happening, that he was able to crash and totally take over a Mac. After he found the crash, he was able to exploit it. It was something like a buffer overflow, and he was able to take out a brand new Mac. And when he announced that, I was like everybody in the audience, hoping to get traffic samples, but he didn't do it live. He said, I don't want you guys to see the packet. So I'm telling you how I did it, but he said, I told Apple privately, and I'm waiting for Apple to patch it. And what Apple did was lie. They announced that David Maynor had faked this. He was an unethical researcher. There was never anything wrong with the Mac, and it was just a coincidence that a month later, they had an update for the driver. And that was common at that time. When Microsoft started by just trying to imprison people for finding vulnerabilities and lie and cover them up. And Apple was very into that much longer. Now that every major company has pretty much given up and accepted that you have to take bullet reports. A lot of them even pay for them. Anyway, that's the game here. Now there's a Nagel algorithm, which you have to disable because that'll take small datagrams and group them together to send them all at once. So that would tend to mess up your plan of sending one deformed packet to see if it crashed, next deformed packet to see if it crashed. So you can disable that. Anyway, so you got to do fault monitoring. Like I said, the simple, simplest way you did it back in the early days, like Dave did, is just ping the machine to see if it's dead. And that might work. 
but often you want something better. And of course, once you find a crash, now you have to figure out why it crashed. And so you have to run a debugger on this, the app in a debugger. And then you can see the memory contents where it crashed and go through the um, exploit development process that we've talked about. Access violation are the most important. That indicates that something is overflowed, something is written where it shouldn't have gone. Now, the most common one and boring one is that the reason I have an access violation is you filled up an entire memory segment and hit the end of the memory segment. And that causes an access violation error, but unfortunately, you can't exploit that. Um, what you're, what's better is if you um, can overrun something like a buffer and hit something interesting like the EIP. And then the EIP gets a stupid value and it tries to return from that. You go to a crazy part of memory. That's the kind you can exploit. Anyway, so that's the... Uh, the basic idea behind fuzzing. And now you can talk about ways to um, analyze it. So static analysis which is analyzing code that's not running. You're looking at either the source code or the binary compiled code, and you're just looking for patterns of input, like you can look for print statements that don't have the format in it. Now, if you have a print statement that doesn't have a format in it, then it might be a format string vulnerability, but it's likely not to be, because uh, the data would have to come from the user. And if the data come from some did not come from the user, then the user won't be able to exploit it. So there are different ways to do this. One is to just find all the broken code. Another is to take all the places where user input comes in and focus only on that. Anyway, so you, uh, if you make a generic fuzzer that just sends deformed SMTP packets, you can test any SMTP software with it. The problem is this sounds like a good idea, but in practice, the bugs you can find this way have all been found long ago. You have to have custom stuff these days to really get much good out of it. So. Like, here's the point. If you just send, like, uh, a 1,000 deformed SMTP packets to a server, then you won't, um, you won't hit all the code in the server. Spike is the thing that does this. I used to have projects where people use this thing. It's a very simple fuzzing platform. You can install it on Linux. It just doesn't find very good results. But you can make a little template, and it will modify things so you can send a variable and you can read the data coming back. You can send fixed strings, or you can send variable strings, and it has a library of variable strings it'll send. So you can use this against the vulnerable server, and it will work. So this will send variable data to the server, and um, what happens is it sends a bunch of stuff, and you can see it sends something like 5,000 long, 5,005, then 21, then 23, and so on. It sends all that stuff, and if you look at the server, it crashes right away on the second or third one because it tries sending just long fields, and the vulnerable server has uh, simple buffer overflows. So it's very easy to find vulnerabilities in the vulnerable server with this spike product. And I used to have students do that in the project, but I decided it's not really worth it because it doesn't extend others. Um, there was a product from Carnegie Mellon that ran on Windows 2008 and would do uh, smarter fuzzing, and we ran all, a whole cluster of machines for like a month looking for crashes and found about a dozen crashes, but none of them were exploitable. And you know, it's, um, I got the impression that this kind of fuzzing is pretty much over. Uh, the kind of fuzzing that really works now is cluster fuzz. Google has come up with several of these fuzzing products. They're really finding real vulnerabilities and they have a whole cluster of servers sending stuff all the time. And what Google says now is you need to have in your software development process, you need to have a cluster constantly fuzzing your stuff all the time in every version as you develop it. Um, which was a good idea. I know um, eight years ago, it used to be considered not worth the bother to fuzz things. Microsoft did not bother to fuzz Vista, and a Belgian researcher or French found two denial of service flaws in Vista within 10 minutes of fuzzing. And so that was what converted Microsoft, around the time they made Vista, to finally add fuzz testing to their security protocol. And now I think everybody pretty much knows you have to do fuzz testing or your product is not going to be safe enough to sell. And anyway, um, the reason Microsoft avoided it is you never know when you're done. It's a random process. So it's not like you go through a view and you know you're done. You fuzz it for a day. Maybe if you fuzzed it for 10 days, you would have found more. So, you know, it's, um, anyway, I got a few cahoots about that. And then I just want to show you the go, I think. So I'll um, find my cahoots, which are here. All right. And this is randomized again, good, all right. I was at a conference where I turned off the randomization, but now it's back. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good. Seems like having at least four people is logical. Give it a few more seconds and see if we're going to get. Ah, oh, good. There we are. All right. Any more coming? All right. We'll go with five. So, what technique makes it easiest to determine whether flaws are reachable? This is one advantage of fuzzing. If it does crash from fuzzing, then you know it was from the user input. It isn't just a bug in the code that was never achieved by user input. That's one reason why it was considered good. Um, all right. Which operation waits for the server to send a prompt? Now these are in that fuzzer attack. Read line, of course, you can do that by logic. All right. What do you have to disable for effective network fuzzing? That's the Nagel algorithm that would combine your package. All right. What kind of exception is most likely to be exploitable? All right, access violation is typically what you want because the idea is some of the data you entered ended up in a register like the EIP, and that's what caused it to crash. <coughs> so anyway, uh, I don't know who that is. I'm guessing maybe Caitlin. Uh, if you don't tell me who they are, I'm going to assume that. I don't even know Caitlin's in this class, though, but I think she is. Ah, perhaps I'm going to get another name. Oh, okay, good. And I'm glad you told me. Otherwise, I would have misappropriated the points. And um, three for Ken and three for Rich. All right. All right, we're trying to make it right, but it's not right. All right, so save that. And this is CNET 127, and it is 11, 13, 19. All right, so what I'm going to do is now, since I don't want to give you a fuzzing project, because I can't find a good one that is important enough to be doing and easy enough to do, I'm just going to show you the um, Go stuff I've been writing, which is important. And... Uh, Kind of fun and i uh, know so some people get nervous about their grades this is a good way to catch up let me just stop the recording and restart